question you all is going to get a shark. We got a shark. And I didn't even have to get bit in half to get one. All right, the, I know, the story that I'm going to, it's okay, you can laugh. It's not going to, it's not going to mess me up if you laugh. Okay. That's a huge shark, sir. Well, at least he's not the one biting my rear end off. I thought you were talking more like something like that. <laughs> oh, like that little guy? Oh, yeah. No. No, we're not talking about that. Told you I was going to get a shark. I got this thing here. I got it on sale. Manager special. $7.77. Normally 30 bucks. It's those for the kids' floaties. It's actually, I don't know, probably about that long. I don't think you can see all of it there, but it's pretty big. If I seen this in the water, I'd really freak out. But anyway. Well, I have seen these in the water, just not like right up against me. So is it like, like actual size of a shark? Like a baby one, like a oh, juvenile. Okay. Juveniles are a little bigger than that. They're like seven feet long. That's more like that three and a half. Perspective. Twice that size as a juvenile robot. That's a little kid's floaty for the pole. So there you go. Well, Sister Trin, Sister Esther, and the rest of you I was telling at church the story I was talking about. I'll go ahead and tell you now. I was going to save it for the podcast anyway. So, um. Well, before we get into that, Brother Ken, don't worry, I'm not going to get my hand bit off by a shark and have a hook for a hand. When I said I was going to go film the shark, I was not going to go jump in the water and film them like those idiots that, like that moron that jumped in the bear enclave and said the bear motioned for me to join him, and then the bear mauled the daylights out of him. I mean, some people are just, just stupid. I remember I got Pastor Daniel years ago, this book called The Darwin Awards. I found it in a, in a bookstore or something. I found it at Barnes & Noble, I think. It was his birthday or Christmas or something. I said, dude, I got you this book, the Darwin Awards, and it's about people that died doing stupid things. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's like like that the herd is getting thinned out of stupidity. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was the Darwin Awards. So the, the goal is just don't be in that book, okay? Yeah. That's, that's the... That's the lesson of the day, the lesson of the night. Do not be in that book, the Darwin Awards. <laughs> All right. But with that said, I wasn't going to jump in the ocean and film the shark. I was going to film it from the sand, and he was up close enough to where I could have did that. But by the time I got there, the dolphins had scared him away. So there you go. So I got pictures of dolphins. So that was cool. But anyway, so yeah, um, Tran Esther and brothers and sisters that I was telling you the story about the guy... I told you the story about the guy who said, um, Jesus saved me. And I told it before here on the, if you can call this a podcast, when the great white was about to bite his head off at Moonstone Beach. And he said, Lord, Jesus saved me. And the dolphins came and ran. Well, the other story I was, I was going to tell tonight was um, there was these surfers. I believe it was in New Zealand or Australia. I think it was New Zealand, actually. And they're Christian surfers. And it showed them on the documentary I watched praying before they went out to surf. They said, Lord Jesus, they're holding hands in a circle. And they said, if we see a shark, let it be okay. And then let nothing happen in Jesus' name. Well, they have it on video. And one of the brothers was out surfing, catching this big wave. And this massive white shark decided to come take a bite out of him. But at the same time, another massive white shark decided to take a bite out of him. So he's one of the, I guess, the few people to be attacked by um, two great whites at the same time. Two monstrous great whites. And you just see these huge white sharks come into the wave, and he's in there surfing, and he disappears. <laughs> and, and his brother's on shore, and he's thinking, man, he said, my brother's dead. He's like, oh, this is horrible. And all of a sudden, his brother pops up out of the water, and he, all he had was a little scratch on his hand. And he got stitches, like, I don't know, 10, 10 20 stitches or whatever on his hand. He didn't lose his hand or anything. And um, he was all right. But um, what had happened was um, these two massive white sharks. I'm talking these things were, were probably over 16 feet long each. Massive. You know, it's funny because back when I was a kid, I thought sharks were 35 feet long. That would be the size of a darn orca or a killer whale. No, they're usually, um, the, the really humongous old ones are like 20 feet long, and that's a female, like like deep blue. You can find her on YouTube, on the internet. Massive white shark. But anyway, so what had happened is when they, they both went after him at the same time, and these two massive white sharks just crashed into each other, wow. and the impact knocked this Christian surfer over the wave, 
And so when he fell, he fell into the break of the wave and it just carried him into shore. Wow. And so all he had was a cut on his hand. So I'm sure the Lord had a lot to do with that. But that's the shark message of the day. But I got this guy for you all because I told you I would. And Brother Ken Ward, I'm not going to get my hand bit off and I have a peg hand. I mean, I wouldn't look good shadow boxing with a peg hook for a hand. Now would I? Not a peg hand, a hook hand. Not, I was thinking peg leg, but a, a hook hand. Yeah, I'm not going to have a hook hand. But anyway, so um, that's that story. But we're still talking about church history. Eighty and six years I've served Jesus and he's done me no wrong. And I've misquoted that so many times over the course of this podcast. I said 80 and three years. I told you it was Clement of Rome. What, what did I tell you? It was Jerome. What other person did I say? We're going to fix that tonight. That was Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. He's considered one of the three church fathers. Polycarp's one of them. So we're going to talk about him today a little bit. But he um, was discipled by the Apostle John. John, um, the Zebedee brother, the one that avoided the death of a martyr. I don't know if he was just closely necessarily discipled by him, but he was definitely influenced by John, and he knew John because John was still alive when he was alive. And John was a very old man. And I believe he was also influenced by Ignatius, and um, I think it was Clement of Rome also um, influenced Polycarp. But those being, I believe, the three church fathers that are often talked about in um, as Subius talks about in his book, Ecclesiastical Church of History by Subius, which is a book that I'll be getting soon, I'll be studying out of, and I'll be begin to preach and teach out of. I remember Pastor Daniel would, um, he would teach out of that book when I first was in ministry, when I was first in serving in ministry and, and getting taught the things of God. He was teaching on church history, and I remember that it's, he would read out of, um, Ecclesiastical History by Eusebius and um, Fox's Book of Martyrs. And there was another, um, some other books that he, that he read out of. But we're going to take a look at some of these um, these church fathers. I've often told you the story of Jan Hus, Jan Hus, Jan Hus. And um, what he, um, how he was burned at the stake. Well, Polycarp, this bishop of Smyrna, he, um, you know, the, the stupid, I guess it was the emperor, wanted people to light incense to him as if he was a god. And he wanted, they wanted Polycarp to deny Christ, to deny Jesus. And he says, 80 and six years I've served Jesus and he's done me no wrong. How can I now blast me, the Lord that died for me? that saved me and died for me. I'm paraphrasing that, but he said, the Lord that saved me and died for me. And so they lit him on fire. And the ancient story goes, as these stories often do. You know, you might say, Brother Rick, they're a little far-fetched, but this is what was said, this is what was stated, that he literally bled so much that it put out the fire that he was being consumed with. And one of the people there stabbed him with a, I think it was a spear or a sword or a knife. Or I think he stabbed him with a dagger and killed him. And he died a martyr. But I like that. Eighty and six years I've served Jesus and he's done me no wrong. If only Christians had that kind of courage today. Surfers go into shark infested waters like stupid morons. And they got more courage than the church. I'm not, you know what? I, I was on there. I was out at the beach um, a couple days ago again, and um, I told you how the how the stupid uh, stingray literally swam between my legs. Well, this time, man, I don't know if it was a stingray or a sand shark, but I felt something slimy and wet come slithering up against my leg in the water, and then it was gone. I was just like, "No, thank you for not stinging me. Thank you, Jesus, for." 
uh, let me get stung. I've seen many of people hopping around and they get when they step on the thing out there. You know, I look wherever I step, but I guess the thing could still creep up on me. But anyway, <clears throat> gotta love it, man. So the surfers are willing to go in shark infested waters. The church is not willing to give up a Sunday because they're going to miss a football game. Are they going to miss the baseball game? You all know I love baseball. I love boxing. But, and, and I got the Dodger station over here. You know, McLean has set that up so we get all the Dodger games. He's a Dodger fan. And so, but when they're playing and it's time to teach and preach, that door is closed in my room. And whatever Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman are doing at that point, I guess I'll have to wait and see till afterwards, after we're done doing the work of God. I remember we're out there at the San Bernardino shelter, the Bell, no, the Bell shelter, Pastor Charles and I, and we're preaching on Super Bowl Sunday. And the big game was on. And everybody had to turn off the TV because where the TV was was where we preached. So, man, these people were hot. So Pastor Charles laid into them about how the game is more important to you than God. And we preach long. <laughs> yeah, we preach long on purpose, too. And after we finally got done preaching, after everybody was amening, receiving the word, supposedly, they couldn't run fast enough to that damn television set see that game see the Super Bowl look ladies and gentlemen God is not on trial we're on trial do we have what it takes to bear his great name you know <clears throat> serving Jesus can be hard if we make it hard but Jesus said my burden my yoke is light but let's face it, we have this bent in our human nature, this diseased Adamic race constantly wanting to go its own way. You know, think about John Zebedee leaning his head on Jesus' chest. Who is it, Lord? You know, he's the one that would go that went to the crucifixion when Jesus was crucified. The only one that avoided the death of a martyr. Peter being the big mouth, I'll die with you. Cuts off Malchus's ear because he couldn't get his head. Couldn't even swing a sword right. I'll die with you, Jesus. I won't run. I won't deny you. <clears throat> Jesus says before the rooster crows three times, you'll thrice, meaning three times, deny that you know me. I don't know the man. cock a doo to do Then he runs off and he cries. You know, a lot of us have been like Peter. But God and Jesus, they love the wayward one. They love the wayward one, and they love to call back the wayward one. You know, not all wayward ones are cowards. Peter was a coward, but he became a hero of the faith. Some of the wayward ones are just straight pissed off. They're just pissed. That's why they're wayward. I understand why Moses had the temper he had, why he was mad. I understand why Elijah ran and why he was mad. I understand why Jonah ran to the tip of Spain until God had to send one of these guys right here to swallow him. Original language says he prepared a giant fish or a great big fish. I've heard um, some commentaries say that it was a giant sea monster. Okay, so maybe it was a leviathan. But it wasn't a whale. No grinning giant whale with a nice smile on his face did not come up and swallow him. It was some monstrous creature that inhaled him. Type and shadow of Jesus and the valley of the earth for three days and three nights. Jonah, the valley of the fish, three days and three nights. Gets puked out on the shores of Nineveh and 
first thing he does is he goes to preach. After, of course, God raises him from the dead because he died in the fish. Think he went into a fish and he was alive? So God raises him up, type and shadow of Jesus Christ. Jesus, three days, three nights, in the earth, the valley of the earth, rises from the dead. Difference between Jesus and Jonah, well, besides that Jesus is Lord and he's God, that aside, talking about personality traits, Jesus was about his father's business, always about his father's business. Jonah was straight up pissed. Went up, sat above Nineveh, waiting for God to destroy the people he preached to. Didn't happen. I knew it, Lord. I knew it. You're going to make me look like a fool. Make me look like a stupid idiot, like a moron. You're going to repent. You're going to feel sorry for him. And you're not going to kill him. Now I'm a prophet that's words just fell to the ground. Now I look like a jerk. So God builds him a plant or a tree to shade him. Because it's hot. Then a worm. God sends a worm and it eats the plant. The plant withers and dies. Now Jonah's really pissed. Really mad. And he says, you're concerned about this plant? He said, there's a hundred thousand souls in Nineveh that I'm concerned with. And then the story ends. You know, Jonah with his temper and his anger, he still had the stuff to admit that he was running from God and that he was a man of God and told the people how to be delivered from the storm. Throw me overboard. So even in his idiocy, with his faults, he still had a lot of character. If you're a man of God, a woman of God, if you're called by God, you cannot escape what you are. A zebra cannot remove its spots. Or remove its... A leopard can't remove its spots. A zebra can't hide its stripes. Stripes aren't going to come off. You got to call a God on you? You're not going to escape. You're not going to get away. You might try. And you might just put yourself into some disastrous, crazy nonsense of a life but you're not going to get away. The Bible tells us that God's call is without repentance, meaning he does not change his mind. Until you're in a coffin, the call remains. The call remains. But the church needs people like Polycarp, and these heroes of faith, these heroes of these fathers of the faith, Eighty and six years I've served Jesus and he's done me no wrong. Wow. The fact that he served him that long is amazing. Then willing to go to the flames. It also said that Polycarp also said, by the way, I'm going to have to paraphrase because I don't remember the exact words that he used, but he said something along the lines. This fire burns for a little while. And then it's put out. He says, you don't know about the fire that's going to burn forever. That's going to burn eternally. He was telling them people, you better get your butt together. You better get saved or you're straight lost and you're going to burn, is what he was telling them. I love the story of Jerome. Jan Hus, John Huss's best buddy. Chickens out, runs off. His, his friend is killed for the faith. Burned at the stake, martyred, 1415, dies singing that Bohemian priest, John Huss. We speak English, so I'll call him John Huss, but it's not the correct pronunciation of his name. It's John Hoos, but we'll call him John Huss. So Jerome goes back, begins preaching and teaching the same way that John Huss did. They arrest him a second time. This time he doesn't chicken out. And the attendant that lights the fire to kill him when they burn him at the stake moves to light it behind him. And Jerome says, If 
If I was afraid to see it, I would not be here. Light it in front of me. They lit him up. And he died a hero of the faith. Chickened out the first time. But he repented. He went back. And he gave his life for the sake of Jesus Christ. For the sake of the gospel. Bringing the gospel back to the common people. Not every Christian in the first century was a martyr. A lot of them chickened out. A lot of them ate the pig or worshipped the emperor or lit the incense. A lot of them did that. We know this means nothing. We know Jesus is Lord, but I'm not ready to die. But we hear the stories about the ones that were willing to give their life for the faith. As in Hebrews 11, the ones listed in Fox's Book of Martyrs. But that wasn't all of Christianity. That was a select few. A select few that were willing to die for Jesus. That were willing to give their life for the gospel. If you don't die for Jesus today, you still got to give your life for the gospel. You got to lay down your low life and pick up his high life. Lay it on the altar and become what he desires you to be. In Jesus' name. All right, so we got through Polycarp. Finally told you the correct name of the man who said those famous words. The shark and the wolf like it, but we'll pick it up. Uh, I don't know if they do. I'm just saying that. But, um, We'll pick it up next week as we proceed further in church history. We talked about the disciples, how they were martyred, how they were willing to die for the sake of the gospel in separate parts of the world. That's the message for tonight. God bless you all. Earl, it is hotter than hell in here. <laughs> Have a good night.